Um, there have been very few changes with respect to child abuse reporting in the past few years. There have been some minor things. For example, if you can't seem to get in touch with CPS, we can now fax them our reports as a first report rather than having to call. Okay, we're allowed to do that. We should still try to make the phone call, you know, um, but, but we're allowed to fax them. The age differentials haven't changed for about eight years now, uh, nine, you know, some eight, nine years. If you have somebody who is 14 or 15 and they're engaging in sexual intercourse with somebody who's 21 years of age or older, you must. If you have someone who is 14 or 15 and they're engaged in lewd and lascivious conduct, which means fooling around up to but not including sexual intercourse, then, and they're fooling around with somebody at least 10 years older than they are by birthdays, we must report it, okay? Um, so those particular provisions have not changed. The one area that's been of some, I wouldn't say debate, but there's been, there's been much more talk of it lately, is that we are not supposed to disclose the record of a child abuse report being, having been made unless we're sending it to CPS or law enforcement. The DA's office, I think, can get it as well. But if somebody requests my record and I have a child abuse report in that record, I'm supposed to take it out and not send it along because the report is governed by at least three different sections of the penal code that says it should only go to very specific parties, no exceptions for people who are requesting a medical record or a, psych a psychiatric or psychological record. Okay? So keep that in mind. It shouldn't be disclosed along with, um, along with the standard kinds of requests for information. I want to mention one thing about immunity from, report, from uh, liability for reporting child abuse or reporting elder and dependent adult abuse. And that is that the courts have very, fairly staunchly protected us from liability when we um, make a report in our capacity as a mandated reporter. They've gone so far in a few cases as to say, um, and I think it was Storch versus Silverman and then McMartin versus uh, Children's Institute International. The court there said, and you, you all remember the, the McMartin case, right? Most of you do. Uh, child care center, daycare center, where the McMartins were accused of ritually, physically, and sexually abusing many children. Um, and it was a very publicized case where um, ultimately the McMartins were found not guilty. And after they were found not guilty, they sued many folks, including the people at um, Children's Institute International who had done the evaluations for the district attorney's office and made many of the reports. And the McMartins argued that these were not reports done as mandated reporters. These were reports that were you know, erroneous and they should be able to sue for them. And in the appeals court, after that case got thrown out, the appellate court quoted a, a different uh, case saying, even if a mandated reporter submits a false report with the intent to vex, annoy, or harass an innocent party, civil or criminal liability cannot be imposed. The reason the court has been so strongly supporting of us is because they realize that if we could be successfully sued, if we could be held liable for making reports that turned out to be erroneous, it would significantly chill the willingness of mental health professionals to make the reports that we're supposed to make. So they're protecting us from liability, and they're very serious about it. Um, in one case, Strex versus Young, Young, which was about 11 years ago, 12 years ago, um, the court said that even in a weak case for reporting, that immunity applies. And in that case, the person was diagnosed with um, what we would now call DID and schizophrenia and claimed that her parents were engaged in ritual sacrifice of, I think, um, some nephews or some, some younger cousins of hers. And um, it turned out that it was a completely innocuous and innocent event that the parents were engaging in. And the parents were outraged that the therapist believed the client and made the report and sued the therapist. And the court protected the therapist. Back to the Tarasov cases, um, I had talked about a little bit, and I want to clarify it, what the Ewing versus Goldstein course, court ultimately was saying. And, um, and what's Interesting about 43.92, which is the codified language with respect to Tarasov, is that earlier cases, 
very carefully followed the law. So in Barry versus Turek, it was found in San Francisco at, at St. Mary's that a psychiatrist treating someone who had assaulted a, um, a staff person on a medical unit, the psychiatrist treating that person was not responsible for the assault because the client had never told the psychiatrist that they were going to do anything to anybody. Okay. Similarly, um, in Tilly versus Schulte, a, a police officer sued the psychiatrist treating a man who shot the police officer, but there was no statement by the client that they were going to shoot anybody. And so, in this case, the court said, we're going to throw it out. In Bragg versus Valdez, which was a 2003 case, things changed a little bit. In that case, a man who had been hospitalized involuntarily, it was a 5150, was released arguably because he didn't have any money. Okay, that was the, that was the uh, allegation. And um, a couple of weeks later, he kidnapped and murdered an elderly woman. And the psychiatrist, Dr. Valdez, who had released him, was sued. And the court allowed it to go forward because they said, at least under the Welfare and Institutions Code, when we're 51. If we release them, we have to release them when we believe that there isn't uh, any basis to keep them in the hospital any longer. They can't have, as most of us know in the vernacular, just a financial cure. Okay? They have to be somebody who's no longer dangerous. Now, whether well, in-laws, are they family members? What about the family member who does quite the opposite, which is we have somebody who is, um, uh, we have a, a younger person, say 25 years old, who gets into drug and alcohol recovery, and their family is um, deeply into the manufacture of methamphetamines. She leaves there, gets into drug rehab, has a really um, positive, successful experience in rehab, and then the father calls a month before graduation and says, my daughter, your client, who I know is your client, has been dealing uh, crank at your agency for the whole time she's been there. And in addition, she's threatening to kill a particular client. The name is given, happens to be somebody who's actually at the agency, um, if they disclose that she's been dealing. Do we rely on that parent, even though, are, are they doing this to advance the patient's therapy? This points to the weakness of the court's language. We have a hard enough time determining whether a client is reliable. When we talk about third parties who we don't know, we're talking about all bets are off. Now granted, here it was a father in the Goldstein case who Goldstein believed was pretty reliable, but the court's decision didn't confine it to that circumstance. They didn't say the parent who you've gotten a, a release to talk to. So arguably in any of these circumstances we are left high and dry. My recommendation and the recommendation that I've been hearing from risk managers is that if the source, you deem the source to be reliable and the client would consider this person to be a family member and you believe it's a reliable source, then proceed. One thing that is interesting about this line of Tarasov cases is that the same court that decided Ewing versus Goldstein in July of 2005, about a year after uh, deciding the Ewing case, heard a case called Calderon versus Glick. And that case involved a man who um, had gone into his ex-girlfriend's apartment and I believe murdered four of her family members before killing himself um, because he had had a delusional belief that she had intentionally exposed him to the HTLV virus and had gone to see an MFT and a psychiatrist about that. The MFT and psychiatrist um, interviewed him and were very specific about, you know, are you threatening anybody? Are you going to hurt anybody? And um, in this case, it was Mr. Rodriguez said, no, I'm not going to hurt anybody. I'm not threatening anyone. Dr. Wright, who was the MFT, um, was examined in the case. And his notes state that Mr. Rodriguez continues to be delusional about his illness. And Dr. Wright testified, I looked at Mr. Rodriguez straight in the face clearly, and I said, do you have any intention to hurt your former girlfriend, Maria Calderon? And he looked at me straight and he said, no. I looked at his body language and there was no fluctuation. There was no deviation. I addressed that very clearly with him and his answer was very clear to me. I looked at him and I lingered to make sure there was no deviation in his behavior because obviously I was concerned about this issue. I concluded that at that time he was not a risk. 
the appellate court threw the case out. They basically relied on the mental health professional's judgment that this person was not a danger. Now, arguably, another expert could have been called in to say, you should have done more. And we should do more than just look at a person in the face and their body language and see whether there's fluctuation. We should be asking questions and trying to get a sense based on history as well, history of, uh, of substance abuse, previous history of violence, and so on. Still, what it shows you is that the court was very much willing to rely on the mental health professional's judgment in this situation. So they weren't willing to go as far as I thought they might be willing to go, which is to second-guess judgments.